request now all the uh, uh, panelists, uh, if possible, to put on your uh, camera. And uh, we're going to start uh, uh, today's uh, webinar. So, um, respected uh, director, IIT Guwahati, Professor T.G. Sitaram, Professor Rajiv Shaw from India Japan Lab, Kyo University, Japan. Professor Reja Rahman from Buget, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Dr. M.S. Lakshmi Priya, IAS, and District Commissioner Bongai Gao, Assam. Dr. Sogoto Karmokar, CPPC Secretary, CDMR. My all uh, colleagues from Center for Disaster Management and Research, Masters and PhD students, and uh, guests, attendees across at least I can see three countries um, from Japan, from Bangladesh, and of course from our own country, India, and various parts of our country. Um, so myself, uh, Shudip Mitra, and I am uh, the head of this Center for Disaster Management and Research. I, on behalf of Center for Disaster Management Research and IIT Guwahati, welcome all the dignitaries, invited speakers, panelists, and all participants on today's webinar to celebrate the first anniversary of our this center. I would take five to seven minutes uh, uh, to, you know, share uh, the journey about this center which just started exactly a year back. So uh, I will just uh, share one PowerPoint presentation right now. I hope all of you are able to see. It. So um, we actually are having this uh, uh, session also online streaming. Uh, over Facebook and uh, YouTube as well. So uh, we are actually uh, uh, having the live streaming on Facebook as well as, as I said, in YouTube. And uh, now let me just uh, give a big background about uh, this center. This uh, center actually uh, you know, started with a with a backdrop, and that is that we, as a small team here, under the leadership of our director, Professor T. G. Sitaram, a year back, uh, we started actually thinking about uh, uh, this center. And uh, uh, as I said, that uh, Professor Sitaram was uh, actually the uh, you know guiding force behind uh, this center, and that uh, initiative has got actually catalyzed by few events, which I will be sharing in a minute with all of you. Today, uh, we all know that uh, disaster management field has been recognized as a full-fledged discipline because this field requires skilled human resources. It also requires research and innovation in a significant manner. And of course, this center is located in Northeastern region, all of you are aware that this region has a challenging geography, poor infrastructure, and it also is prone to various kinds of disasters. So considering all this, we require a diversified expertise. And fortunately, IIT Guwahati is uniquely placed in this aspect. We have various disciplines having diversified experiences. As I said that there were some you know, catalytic effect. And one of the, uh, you know, force behind this center to come into reality was none other than Honorable Prime Minister's convocation speech on 2020, where he actually advised, uh, you know, IIT Guwahati to come up with a center for disaster management. So with a vision to develop a state of art research, innovation and knowledge dissemination half for disaster risk reduction, 
IIT Guwahati has come up with this center with few objectives and a strong philosophy behind that. We also thought that human resource development through not only skill development, but also through postgraduate academic programs could be the requirement for this region as well as for the country. Creating awareness through various outreach activities, creating a pool of interdisciplinary manpower, and then provide technical and social assistance to this region and elsewhere was the you know, objective and philosophy behind developing or establishing this center. The thrust areas of this center, uh, a year back when we actually initiated, we started with uh, uh, this uh, few actually thrust area because we at IIT Guwahati do have already some existing faculties at different departments to contribute in these thrust areas. We have around 30 faculty members for various departments as mentioned in this slide. And you can see that, that, uh, uh, that we, have, we have social sciences, we have uh, faculty from mechanical, electronics, so a well mix of, of expertise which is required today for disaster risk reduction. We kick-started our academic program. Uh, you know, um, I must mention here that uh, Honorable Director of IIT Guwahati and a small team of us, we worked and in October, um, if I am correct, in October 2020, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, started for action and then already within three months, uh, we actually started our activities on 18th of January, a year back, when um, uh, Director Professor Sitaram appointed me as the head of this center and uh, asked me to start the activities of this center. So we uh, then uh, got uh, in last year, July itself, the first batch of masters and PhD with us. All of them are attending today uh, in, in this uh, webinar. I'm sure they will be interacting with some of you. We have a uh, you know, external advisors. Um, all of you might be knowing uh, these three individuals. Uh, they are well known in the field of disaster management. Formally, because of various reasons, the formal launching of this center took some time for pandemic and, and other reason. Honorable Chief Minister of, of Asham uh, was kind enough to, to, to formally launch this center uh, in a virtual way. And immediately following that event, we had the first international webinar uh, from our center, uh, where uh, various uh, you know, speakers from different countries joined on that webinar. Now, just uh, quickly, let me share the journey of, of uh, uh, you know, this center over the last one year. So, as you see that we, we started uh, uh, on 18th of January, uh, I was uh, asked uh, by uh, Director IIT Guwahati Professor Sitaram to take the charge of this center and immediately we started the activities. 18th January it took over and then CPPC uh, is the committee, academic committee of the center, very, very important uh, for any center. Um, so we, uh, this committee was formed on 29th of January and then on 18th February, various other committees were formed. We started, uh, you know, also signing other kind of uh, activities like uh, memorandum of understanding with uh, Northeast Space Application Center on 28th of June, and then on 12th July just now, which I shared that uh, Honorable Chief Minister of Assam had the formal launch of our center, and then the next MOU we have signed with National Institute of Disaster Management on 22nd of July. Then within a week, uh, 29th of July, uh, the day actually arrived, the center got the first batch of masters and PhD students. They joined our center. And then uh, 3rd of January, this year only, the second batch of PhD student also has joined. So this is, uh, this is in a brief, the journey that, that uh, the CDMR has uh, you know, taken off uh, over the last one year. So, uh, with with this uh, you know small uh, uh, number of people uh, students 
uh, we we actually we started also initiating various proposal five proposal has been submitted in different organization we organized three na national and international webinar and also we are contributing in various state and national policy doc develop document development so with this i just uh, stop here and uh, now it's is is uh, the time actually uh, to invite the honorable uh, director of iit guwahati professor uh, tg sitaram let me take uh, just a minute to introduce professor sitaram to all of you uh, present here today in this webinar professor sitaram has taken over as the director of our institute on july 1st 2019 before that he was a senior professor at Depart department of civil engineering indian institute of science bengaluru he was a former founder chairman of a center for infrastructure sustainable transport and urban planning at iic bengaluru presently he is the honorary professional fellow at university of golf gong australia from 2019 to 22 2022 and distinguished professor at hong kong university international innovation center china Professor Sitaram presently is the chairperson of the Research Council, CSR Central Building Research Institute, known as CBRI at Rurki. He's also the chairman, executive council of Visheshwara Industrial and Technological, Technological Museum in Bangalore. He is also the governing council member of National Council of Science Museum, a very, very important institution in our country. And he is also the EC member of AICT Government of India. He is the founder president of International Association of Coastal Reserver Research, registered in NSW Australia. He is the president of Indian Society of Earthquake Technology, which is known as ICET. He is presently the chairman of IICT Southern Western Journal Committee, based at Bengaluru. Professor Sitaram is recipient of the C.V. Raman State Award long back in, nine, uh, in the year 2002. As recognition and appreciation of exceptional contribution in the field of engineering sciences. He is the fellow of Institution of Civil Engineers, UK fellow of ASC and many other societies. Due to the paucity of time, I just cut uh, his introduction here and I request Professor Sitaram to deliver the inaugural address of today's webinar. Professor Sitaram, over to you. Namaskar to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sudip Mitra, head CDMR. Distinguished guests today, Professor Rajiv Shah, India Japan Lab, Kyo University, Japan, Professor Muhammad Razawur Rahman, Buet, Bangladesh, Dr. Lakshmi Priya, IAS, District Commissioner Bongaigao, and uh, all our colleagues, Dr. Sogata Karmakar and other colleagues who have joined online and my dear students and also other participants on this uh, first anniversary of the Center for Disaster Management and Research at IIT Guwahati. First of all, let me wish you, wish the center a happy birthday of one year completion. And also this is uh, along with this, uh, Dr. Mitra is organizing international webinar on role of academics and governance in disaster risk reduction. It's a very, very important topic. Maybe I will focus my inaugural address more on the, what would be the role of academics and governance in disaster risk reduction. But anyway, Dr. Mitra has already given you an idea how the center was formulated. The day I joined at IIT Guwahati, I thought that uh, there must be a center in the Northeast because this is, uh, area where a lot of floods and in zone five in earthquake zones. So a lot of earthquakes are also happening in this area. And large, actually large earthquakes have happened here only. Uh, some earthquake of 1950 and 1897 earthquakes. And then uh, landslides. So you name, you know, all the kinds of uh, uh, disaster they're prone to, this area is prone to. So disaster risk reduction is a key aspect of this. To do this, higher education has a major role to play. 
I thought, uh, you know, as soon I joined in July 2019, I started thinking about this, but it took almost a year to formulate and uh, make a group uh, carved out of civil and other departments, mechanical, electrical, and everybody. And uh, it's a trigger when the Honorable Prime Minister announced uh, during our 22nd convocation uh, to also told us to start a disaster studies in the Northeast. So which all culminated into formation of this uh, new center for disaster management and research. So we are actually looking for some more partners other than NESAC and NIDM. Friends, uh, let me take you to the topic on role of academics and governments in disaster risk reduction. As you know, Honorable Prime Minister of India in his 10 point agenda, which was outlined by him for disaster risk reduction, he has asked actually to form India universities and institution network for disaster risk reduction. Short named as IUINDRR, which is actually located at NIDM. Okay. And the first executive committee of this meeting is on day after tomorrow, 20th of first executive meeting of the Inter India Universities and Institution Network for Disaster Risk Reduction is happening on 20th of January 2022, where I am also one of the executive committee member. And 165 universities, and it may be more now, uh, have joined by then this uh, university network. And this is uh, Honorable Prime Minister mentioned uh, saying that, you know, to address the agenda six of the uh, 10 point uh, agenda of the Honorable Prime Minister to develop a network of universities to work on disaster issues in India. So luckily, you know, we were the one of the very early members of this IU, INDRR, uh, IIT Gohati, CDMR is also a member. This uh, IU INDRR has a agenda. So in 2018, Asian Ministerial Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction reiterated the need to incorporate disaster risk reduction education at primary, secondary, and tertiary levels, and also professional training, partnering with higher education institutions, Universities and other science and technology communities have been envisioned for promoting innovative technology and research, facilitate capacity development, and contribute to decision making for addressing local risks and the needs of the most vulnerable. Honorable Prime Minister of India has given this 10 point agenda on the disaster risk reduction. Agenda 6 of the Prime Minister emphasizes on developing such a network of universities to work on disaster issues. So to do this, to promote common efforts in partnership with the scientific and technological community, academy and the private sector to establish, this was created at NIDM uh, as part of the National Disaster Management Plan, which is also aligned with Sendai framework of disaster risk reduction, which highlights the vital role of education and the integration of DRR into curricula at various levels, besides outlining the role of universities in technical research center. So here I would like to congratulate IIT Guwahati team has come up with a both MS research program and also a PhD program, and also several you know certification programs should also be done in this area of disaster risk reduction. So to address this uh, commitment of India to keeping the importance of universities and institutions. India Universities and Institution Network for Disaster Risk Reduction who is being established by an IDM. As I told you, 165 universities have joined the network. There is also a platform created. The website has been already created. So if some of you would like to see IUINDRR dash NIDM, if you Google it, you will find the website. The memorandum of understanding, uh, a memorandum of association of these activities under IU, INDRR are to promote effective partnership, 
among universities across the country and generate, collect, coordinate, and disseminate information to people, governments, intergovernmental and non governmental organizations, and international and bilateral agencies, and also to facilitate and coordinate national and international advocacy on issues of major concern to IU, INDRR, NIDM, and its member organizations, to facilitate the establishment and strengthening national professional councils and societies or other groupings of universities and research organizations with views similar to that of IU, INDRR, to maintain liaison with the national, state, and local level designated body engaged in DR, to organize meetings, forums, and conferences to meet the objectives. So in this, uh, so far, uh, the action taken by the NID, IU, INDRR, NIDM, uh, as I told you, they have created this and they have developed a memorandum of association. And also there was a curtain riser workshop on India universities and institutions in some time in 25th February 2021. Because of the, the, this uh, pandemic, most of these events happened online. And uh, there is a membership of IUI and DRR, as I told you, right now there is no fee. Anybody can join. Please write to an IDM and you can, your university or your college can become a member of the IUI and DRR and IDM. There is a web page and they will send you user ID and password to join, which is uh, confidential. There is a lot of uh, data already been uploaded. As of now, as I told you, 165 universities are part of this network. There is also uh, there is a logo creation contest was created between 10th June and 21st July. And the first phase of this activity to capture experiences and knowledge at the national level, uh, invited nomination across the country and basis on received nomination of the two working groups have been formed for the development of zero draft of curriculum for UG and PG level. So even this is actually, you say, curriculum for you. So you can actually borrow this curriculum and adopt in your university or in your college. Okay. And the second, in the second phase, uh, that uh, you, INDRR, the NIDM, uh, will actually uh, get a feedback to, they have taken feedback from a wider cross section of the academy and organization with constructive responses received from 39 universities, uh, the curriculums and the syllabus on disaster risk reduction and management have been finalized. The, there are three courses actually they have finalized. Foundation course for disaster risk reduction, certificate course on disaster risk reduction management, and PG diploma on disaster risk reduction management. So you can see now these are all readily available to you to start utilizing the curriculum and adopting at your university. And uh, you know, in, the, in this uh, NIDM has brought out actually model course curriculum for postgraduate level model course curriculum for undergraduate level in disaster risk reduction and management. Okay, this is uh, now ready for utilization and to develop the capacity building and knowledge creation program. Several workshops uh, have been organized even before uh, the first executive committee meeting. And uh, so for to mainstream DRR into higher education, very high profile executive committee members have been selected. And the first EC meeting is going to happen on 20th of January, 2.30 online. So there is a clear budget from the government for organizing the workshops and other things. They do also call, send out call for uh, organizing workshops. So, so there is a recommendation for knowledge creation under network, recommendation from the program and activities, and uh, these are uh, proposed action plans for the 2022 and 2023. And this executive committee will decide the future. Okay, that is like development of curriculum, regional conference, national conference, national seminar, research projects. There will be two research proposals will be open for all members uh, of this uh, network, awareness generation program, and uh, this uh, membership. Uh, Right now, it is given to the universities. The individual membership also will be open soon. And there will be observers from the government on this side. And all these will be available on the IU, IDDIN, and the website. Okay. 
So there will be a very interesting uh, information available to all of you on this. And uh, I hope all of you will get benefit. So this uh, IUIN DRR Memorandum of uh, Association basically highlights uh, that uh, India is also experiencing large uh, of amount of economic loss, almost close to 10 billion, out of which more than 7 billion is due to floods, which is recurring phenomenon in most of the states of the country and particularly in Nassau. So one of the key drivers behind such increasing economic loss due to disaster is lack of knowledge about hazards and access to risk information, which is essential to undertake any risk reduction action. So there is a continuous accumulation of newer risks due to increasing exposure to hazards resulting from risk insensitive planning mechanism, ecosystem degradation, population growth, and poverty. The risks induced by climate change are adding a further new dimension to the existing disaster risk profile of India. So building on this uh, Yogo framework for action, which featured knowledge, innovation, and education, to build a culture of safety and resilience as a key priority, the Sunday framework for disaster risk reduction between 2015 to 2030 we have only left with about uh, eight more years, which identifies understanding disaster risks as its first priority for action, enhancing awareness, including through formal and non-formal education. This is where you know this uh, university network is going to play a major role. And uh, this, uh, I invite all of you to become the members of this uh, university, inter-university network and develop a network of universities to work on disaster issues in India. So this is very, very critical. And uh, I hope you will take the advantage of this. And there, there is a clear role of academics and governments in this uh, disaster risk reduction. IIT Guwahati has done tremendously well in formulating the curriculum at a master's level already. So we have gone beyond what this network has proposed. We have created a MS research program and a PhD program. So we are in advanced stage, but several of these, you know, can be also taken certificate program, which uh, we are already a member. So I request uh, Dr. Mitra and his colleagues to look into this uh, uh, the curriculum and start organizing several certification courses okay? uh, so that, you know, everybody gets uh, educated and also aware of the disaster risk reduction and it is very very important and particularly uh, the way the northeast is growing is going to be the biggest policy of the government of india with that we have large growth has to grow in a very big way for that disaster risk reduction is one of the key issues in all the design aspects so i hope all of you will take the advantage of it and also all of you will become the member of this uh, Inter-University Network, which is established first time in India, and Government of India has done this through National Institute of Disaster Management. So I encourage all of you to use this, and this uh, network is not only for India, it is also for international universities also can join us and uh, learn from each other. That is what is, is uh, I would like to also say a few words about IIT Guwahati. IIT Guwahati has actually tremendously done well, even though during the pandemic, we have started five new schools, other than the Center for Disaster Management and the Center for Indian Knowledge System. The new schools are School of uh, Health Science and Technology, School of uh, Business, School of Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, School of Agro and Rural Technology, and School of Energy Science and Engineering. All of them, we have hired already a faculty and uh, we are actually going ahead with uh, many of these schools will also offer an undergraduate program or at least start with a master's program. They are all starting in July. So uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, we also strengthened our industry interaction. Okay, And in particularly in disaster risk reduction, I also uh, invite all our colleagues on innovation and aspects of it so that you, know, you can be a startup you know, many new startups can happen. So in India, India is buzzing with a lot of uh, startup activities. On 16th uh, January, the Prime Minister declared 16th January as a startup India, startup day. So I 
I request all the um, students who have registered here. And we also in IIT Guwahati, you know, if you have any new idea to be patented, Institute will pick up the entire cost of patenting and also publication in top notch journals. General cost of publication will also be paid by the IIT Guwahati to you. If you're not aware of that, you talk to your head and utilize these facilities which have been made specifically in the last two years so that you can excel in whatever research and innovation you're doing. Research and innovation are the very, very key aspect of our society, which is going to be a knowledge economy. And uh, I think all of you should participate and involve yourself. With these few remarks, again, thank the organizer and Dr. Mitra for inviting me to give the inaugural address of the, this role of academics and governments in disaster risk reduction. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for your motivating words. Um, yes, uh, uh, we will keep in mind about the network uh, of universities. Uh, 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 we are as a CDM are also are already registered there. So uh, now uh, it's my great privilege to uh, introduce the next panelist, Professor Rajiv Shaw. Professor Shaw is a prof, uh, full professor in graduate school of media and governance of KU University, Japan. He's also the head of the lab, India Japan lab at uh, KU University. He did his studies in Yokohama National University and Osaka City University in Japan and University of Allahabad and Bardhawan University, in West Bengal, India. He is co founder of a Delhi based social entrepreneur startup. Resilience Innovation Knowledge Academy, Vivika, and chair of the board of two Japanese non-government agency, SIDS Asia and CWS Japan. Professor Shaw is the co-chair of the United Nations Asia Pacific Science Technology Advisory Group, popularly known as APSTAG, and CLA for IPCC's sixth assessment report. He has 55 books and more than 400 research articles in the field of environment, disaster management, and climate change. Professor Shaw is the recipient of prestigious Pravashi Bharatiya Sanman Award 2021 for his contribution in education sector. Pravashi Bharatiya Sanman Award, as all of you know, is the highest honor conferred on overseas Indian and person of Indian origin from the Honorable President of India. Worldwide, Professor Shaw is well known as an authority in the field of DRR and disaster management. So today morning, actually, Professor Shaw uh, has uh, uh, made a request that, uh, uh, you know, around uh, 315, he had to go for a very urgent uh, meeting at his university and in person. So for this uh, emergency situation, he has shared his uh, presentation video with me, but he promised that he will be back uh, for the Q&A round because that's the round he is uh, looking forward to. So uh, let me now share um, Professor Shaw's uh, you know, video presentation message to to all of you. Kindly let me know if that is uh, visible. Can any panelist confirm me if that is visible? Right now, only folders are visible. Okay. You have to minimize this one. Yeah. Minimal, yeah. Run the video. Now? No. Click on the video once again. One second.
Is it visible now? Uh, no. Probably video is opening, but you go to I mean, probably there is a problem with the sharing. You go for sharing entire screen and yeah. then. Yes, yes, that's what I'm going to do now. At the bottom, there is a share option. Yeah. It should work now. Yes. Please run the video. Yes. Thank you. No sound, okay? Please unmute your microphone. Sound not coming. Namaskar. Now it is okay. uh, Professor Sitaram, Director, IIT Guwahati, Dr. Lakshmi Ripia. We're unable to hear again. Professor Mitro, you're unable to hear.
back in 1858 that time he was one of the very few people who has no, seen both and us education system and that time japan was under the oriental education system <laughs> what he wanted to do is to combine the oriental education system with us and europe and he made a new curriculum, new ways of teaching in Keio University. And his students, <clears throat> the first few graduates of Keio University, they have started the Meiji Restoration, which is very famous in Japan, which actually was the root of the modern governance system in Japan. And through that restoration, the banking system, the ministries, the governance mechanism, the constitution of Japan was laid out. So what I'm trying to point out here that academics always play a very, very important role in governance in Japan, but I'm sure that in many parts of the world, including India, Bangladesh, and all our South Asian countries. By saying that, I think we also need to keep in mind that the world is changing, the world is evolving, and the risk landscape is evolving very, very fast. I remember like usually when you talk about the academic's role in governance, the advisory role is quite common. I Means being the academic, we love to be advisor, advisor of some committees in governance from here and there, from national to local, and all these different types of uh, advisory group. But I think time has now come to change our approach from advisory to take a core responsibility. When I say this core responsibility, I think Advisory is something from outside. You give advice. Science-based advice, it is very, very important. But when we have the core responsibility with the government, that's the time when science and the governments or academics and the government, they come together, they co-design and they co-deliver the solution. And I think this is very, very important that we need to start to change our mindset from being advisory role to take the core responsibility. I often say this word that in, in academic field, we love to say this last mile communication, last mile communication of our research result. And for the last few years, I have been thinking that when we say last mile, like we put mile zero at our end, so-called academic end in our laboratory. And we think the community is the last, last mile. And we have been doing that. But again, I will say that possibly time has come to a little bit challenge that idea of the last mile communic uh, communication. From last mile, it has to be the first mile, the last mile needs to be changed to the first mile and what does it mean mile zero in the community in the field and then see that what are the problems there what are the key challenges there and then try to make a solution and try to make a designing a solution and deliver a solution. I think what I'm again trying to point out here is that <clears throat> being in the academics in the disaster risk reduction, 
we need to think or we need to change our mindset we need to have more collaborative approach we need to go beyond our comfort zone and work with the local government work, work with the local community with possibly the local non government non profit organization citizen group and try to make a collective designing of different types of solution i think that this change there have been actually this change um, is observed actually it's currently observed in many places and my sincere wish and hope that if we are able to make this change of the science and governance relationship we'll be able to create lots of new and social innovation lots of new breakthrough in the disaster risk reduction that's my like overall uh, comment on this particular topic but i have three specific other uh, issue which i'd like to point out and where i hope and believe that the cdmr can play a critical role in future number one is the science based decision making i think in many places still the decisions are made ad hoc at governance level at different governance level be it national state district sub district and so on and i don't blame this on the governance side it's not the fault of the governance i will say that it's our fault that we have not been able to generate a capable pool of human resources who can make risk informed decision and that is our responsibility in the university that is our responsibility in the academics that we need to develop the mindset we need to develop the pool of human resources of a different discipline who can take different types of risk informed decisions and i'm confident that the cdmr has just started one year back but i think with this small start it has a big potential to serve this or to generate this human resource in future and i'm sure that cdmr will be in the right track for that my point number 2 is <clears throat> the issue of the open governance uh i was recently uh, reading the science technology policy of india which was which was i think released last year and if you if you go to the policy there are around 11 to 13 different issues which are are uh, focused and it starts with the open science open data and open governance and i'm very very impressed with that that yes that is possibly the key starting point in the disaster risk reduction we have been discussing about the open governance in my role as the chair of the un science technology advisory group we have been trying to promote in different platform uh bo both in the global regional as well as in the national level the importance of open science open data and open governance we often face different types of data problem but i think with the advancement of the technology with the new and the disruptive technologies we can and we are able to address the very basic data issues uh, i'll give you an example in july uh, last year 2021 in japan uh, in a place called atami we had a major landslide and the damage assessment of that landslide was completed within 5 hours from the occurrence of the landslide how was it because we made a detailed analysis and we published the first paper actually on this open data open governance in drr disaster risk reduction in japan and that was a big lesson for me personally 
like this particular prefecture, Shizuoka prefecture, where this Atami city is located, they had the point cloud data. And this point cloud data, like different types of topography, geomorphology, vegetation data, and so on. So these were, they made an open data, uh, which can be accessed by anyone. So immediately after the disaster, there was a very quick coordination among the prefecture government and some of the tech companies, private companies. Uh, so these are small, small startup and who has different ex expertise on drone, on VR, on AI, on cloud data analysis, and so on. And combining all these different uh, technology, they could generate the overall damage assessment within five hours and give the report to the vice governor. And that has been used for all the relief rescue operation and so on. We, we actually did a detailed analysis of the whole process, the timeline, how the decisions were taken and so on. I think the most important part is that in the government level, we need a very clear policy and strategy for the open data and open science. Technology is advancing. So if we have that open data and open science, then there are many people they can actually make different types of analysis. And that particular platform where this collaboration of different types of technology can be done, I think that is our role in the academic and governance together, that how we create that particular ecosystem of open data ecosystem or open governance ecosystem. And I see that with, uh, with the new science technology policy of government of India, CDMR can really contribute significantly on this particular topic to generate this open governance ecosystem, at least to start with in Assam and gradually in the whole Northeast region. And that's my second point. And my third and the last point is on this adaptive governance. When you talk about the governance in the disaster risk reduction, major challenge what we find is the speed. You know that when we have a governance mechanism that changes in the governance system, it takes time because it is a regulatory and legal framework. You can't change it every year or once in two, three years because there are many different issues, accountability issues, there are funding issues, there are transparency issues, so quite complicated. But on the contrary, so we often find that the yes, governance system is very rigid. That's one observation. But on the contrary, two things are doing, uh, like making lots of changes and very first change, the change is very, very fast, which is very specifically related to the disaster risk reduction. Number one is the risk landscape, the overall global, regional, national, local risk landscape are changing very fast, whether it is the climate, whether it is the uncertainty, whether it is the new pandemic risk. So the whole risk landscape is getting more complex and more compound risks are happening or what you call the cascading hazards are happening. So it's not just only one event that the flooding or an earthquake or a cyclone. So cyclone is happening when there is a pandemic. Also maybe the cyclone is happening in a time possibly which is not a real cyclone season, but possibly it's either say for example, in a very hot weather. So there are the heat wave, there are pandemic and the impact of cyclone. So similarly, there are many different complex things are happening. And this is actually changing. This risk landscape is changing actually a very, very fast way. And we cannot address this risk issue with a disaster management plan, which is maybe 10 or 15 years old. So we need to have some changes in that governance mechanism. And another issue of which is high speed change, I told that there are two factors. One is the change in the risk landscape and another one is the technology evolution. What we have seen in last two years of pandemic is possibly 20 years of innovation. And this is not, I am saying, 
usually it's 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 the, the most of the technology gurus they have been actually talking about the same thing so i think this very very high speed of technology what we used to call the emerging technology is becoming essential technology i always say that the today's emerging technology is tomorrow's essential technology so the technology evolution speed and its use in different disaster risk reduction aspect becoming very very fast but again it needs a governance mechanism to cope with this particular speed of the technology evolution so i mentioned earlier that the governance the real governance scheme cannot be changed that fast what we can do is possibly introduce adopt and implement the concept of what we call the adaptive governance only through the adaptive governance and adaptive decision making we need to cope with these two very high speed changes risk landscape and technology and again uh, my strong hope with cdmr is that this adaptive governance can be taken off a very important research topic on different issues actually you do it in flood you do do it in landslide you do it in the complex emergency situation you do it in the uh, regional planning and all those type of things so this flexible decision making is one of the very very important point by flexible i need to also highlight that i'm not talking about ad hoc decision making it has to have a science based adaptive governance there needs to be a proper science behind that there needs to be a proper data behind that there needs to be a proper analysis behind that but this flexible decision making will be very very important and that's why the science academics and the governance interface needs to be very strong so those are the few words i had i strongly hope and believe that the cdmr uh, with the great uh, leadership of uh, professor sitaram and the uh, director uh, professor mitra uh, it's an extremely good hand and i think that it will play very good it shows a very good leadership role not only in japan and not only in assam but also in the northeast region and also beyond and i'm very happy to see also our esteemed uh, professor uh, rezaur bhai Uh, whom I have worked earlier also in JICA projects in Bangladesh, and I think that it can bring a new collaboration. It can strengthen our cross-border, transboundary collaboration, and I will be very much looking forward to see that the science, academe, and the governance, this uh, transboundary collaboration can really make lots of difference. With that, thank you very much, and namaste. uh thank you professor shaw for your enlightening speech and also giving lot of uh, food for thoughts for not only for for uh, cdmr you know researcher faculty but also for our young students and i am sure that uh, there will be a few queries which we will take uh, at the end of all the speakers uh, you know they share their thoughts so the next uh, panelist we have uh, um Dr. M. S. Lakshmi Priya. She is an IS official uh, from 2014 batch, and not only an IS officer. Dr. Lakshmi Priya is a MBBS doctor from Government Medical College, Tiruvannathapuram, Kerala. So I would like to call uh, her as a Dr. Lakshmi Priya in real. So, um, Dr. Lakshmi Priya. got also an award uh lv reddy award for best outgoing probationer of 2014 ias batch from uh northeast india she has worked as sub collector additional collector collector in two district assistant secretary of government of india deputy secretary of government of assam was awarded with the chief minister's special award for excellence in administration in 2019 
got several awards, including best district uh, in India for fisheries, and her district uh, name is Bongaigao. Urban Development and Scotch Awards for five projects. A very active officer um, in, in Assam. Apart from that, she has another hat. She is a Karnat Karnataki vocalist, and she has performed more than 100 stages all around the country, including Rashtrapati Bhavan and Indira Gandhi Center for Arts. She loves trekking, an avid reader, and a movie buff. You'd be amazed to know the best friend of Dr. Lakshmi Priya is none other than our beautiful three-year-old daughter, Ms. Mahalakshmi. Dr. Lakshmi Priya, over to you. For all the kind words that you have spoken about me, it is an honor to be part of uh, this panel discussion. I have known uh, Dr. Sudhir Mitra and his wife over some works that we have done together in our district, especially regarding the reduction of malnutrition among children and now regarding disaster management. Uh, before we uh, before I start talking about my district and what we exactly do here, I would like to uh, thank Professor T. G. Sitaram, the director of IIT Guwahati, Professor Rajiv Shaw, the Japan Lab, Kyoto University, and chair of the UN Science Technology Advisory Group, Professor Mohammad Raza Rahman, Institute of Water and Flood Management, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. All the faculty and all others who are listening to this webinar. Uh, from what I was listening to the other speakers speak before me, Professor T.G. Sita Ramsa mentioned in detail about the India universities and institutions network for disaster reduction, this reduction and NIDM. I was going through the website, it's very interesting. So, but I don't think there is a personal membership possible right now. I tried for that. Since we are not part of institutions, perhaps that would also be opened up. So we'll be happy to be members because we are the first responders to any kind of disaster that happens in any part of the country or the world. Also, I found an interesting part of role of women in disaster man reduction management in NIDM website. That's also quite interesting. And uh, with respect to the Center for Disaster Management and Research, NIIT Guwahati, headed by Dr. Mitra, I've seen that there are some master's courses, but none of them are online or distance. So may I request that some of them may be made online or distance, so we may also participate in it. And I've been listening to Professor Rajiv Shah. Of course, he's not there with us now. But, uh, you know, in Japan, there is an interesting concept of in Sukuroi, that means repairing with gold. If a pot is broken, if they repair it using some kind of an adhesive with gold mix in it, mixed with it. So ultimately, what's broken becomes an even more wonderful thing once you repair it. So disaster is something like that. Once you face a disaster, it might look like everything is over. I'm talking about uh, this with such conviction because from the time I joined in Assam, I've been facing one disaster after the other over these years from the time I was a sub-collector. And he also spoke about science-based adaptive governance. So that is a very interesting concept. That is precisely what we are doing in Omega. Uh, basically, you see there are many embankments with respect to Assam, it's majorly floods that we discuss about. Of course, earthquakes are also there, but then floods are the ones that are annual events uh, in every part of Assam, to be you know, to be fair. So, in my district, uh, in the year 2020, there was uh, there was a major flood that affect that was that affected almost 50 villages of a location because of the flood in the Ai Manas River at a place called Manipur in Bongaiga. Overnight, I had to evacuate a large number of people and then 
uh, we have around seven inches of sand in that place even now that makes agriculture uh, literally impossible. Now I'm replacing them with some other kind of livelihood activities for the people of that area to sustain. So we were quite worried about what what would happen this year. We had sustained such, a, we had suffered in 2020 and I wasn't ready to let that happen once again for the people of that area. And it is not possible to rehab, you know, shift, relocate everyone overnight. So when you actually see it happen in front of your eyes, you just want to do something so that uh, sustainable changes are possible so that people don't face it once again. What we did was we spoke with Geological Survey of India. They came over, they did a survey, they gave us an input regarding the possibility of a flood reoccurring in that place and why the geology, the geography of that place, the geology of that place was significant enough to take some calculated risks and make some interventions. Based on their input and the input from the Central Water Commission, we decided to make a bund, construct a bund. The bund is totally 11 kilometers. Some of it was done by water resources. The rest of it, I got it done through the people who were affected, people of that place who were affected through the MG and RGS scheme. So we, we had 7.44 kilometers of embankment or bund made by the local people from MG and RG, and I paid them around three crores in total. Because they had no livelihood options at all, so I felt that this is a way I could help them. But we were quite worried about sustainability of the environment. So we went through some research that was done majorly in Bangladesh. I'm sure Professor Mohammad Ghazar Rahman will know about them. It is about uh, what is called as vetiver. It is a grass vetiveria cisanoids that uh, has roots that grow vertically down for many, many meters. It holds on to the sand or the, the material and in which it grows in. And it ensures that uh, the, the, the structure is intact. So this year we had much greater floods as compared to last year. But uh, believe, I do not know if you would believe me, the bun still stands. So the local people weren't convinced initially that if we do uh, vetiver cultivation, we'll be able to save the bud. But once it was proven, now it is being taken up all over the state. Now you see, this is where this is how science can actually help us uh, administrators in the field, how governance can be supported by science. So I think the idea of science-based adaptive governance is exactly what should be taken up. With respect to disaster risk reduction, as all of you are well aware, the preparedness phase, mitigation phase starts quite early. Once disaster happens, you've got to, uh, you only can manage the uh, situation and reduce as much of fatality and uh, loss as possible. But the ideal thing to do is start planning in advance for uh, mitigation and risk reduction. So for that, uh, I have seen and understood from my experience in the field that two main components are there. The first component is that there is a human resource that has to be developed. And the second component is of physical structures like the bunt. With respect to human resources, what we are doing here in Bongaiga is that I have a total of 65 gram panchayats and 563 villages, totaling of 10 lakh population under me, out of which 279 villages are identified as vulnerable. So we have what is called village level Pratirodhi uh, Dal, meaning a group of people who are first responders. It is headed by a head teacher of the village 
who is well respected. Then we have Apada Mitras and Pradarodhi Bandhus, along who work along with the Gram Panchayat. They are the first respondents and then we work with them. They immediately let us know of what is happening. We get to know some, some of the, some of the issues we get to know uh, a bit early because of the predictions. We have a 24 by 7 functional uh, control room at all times in the DC office, which receives calls, alerts, and from where we send out alert messages. So I believe working on the human resources is extremely important and whatever new technology or uh, possible plans that uh, a particular location like Bongaiga can take up, if it is worked upon by the academicians, then it will be of much help to handle such situations. I have, uh, we had uh, come up with a, a report on our Zero casualty mission. In Bongaigao last year, we have worked continuously over the last two years and ensured that in floods, no one loses life. It was a regular thing that people would die, cattle would die. But this time over the last one year when we worked, finally we have been able to come up with our result of zero casualty. We have uh, published a report in the effect that was released by Honorable Chief Minister, sir, by handing over to the Chief Secretary of Assam, being the chairman of the Assam State Disaster Management Authority. Uh, this is our uh, report. I have a soft copy of it as well, which I will share with everyone now. I'll share a small presentation. Uh, Dr. Mitra, if you can tell me how, how much time do I have now? Or should I stop now? Or how should I go about it? You can actually uh, you know, you can show it uh, this uh, small presentation in five minutes and then probably you can summarize the thing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is my presentation visible now? It's come, it's coming. Yeah, it has come. Yeah. All right, sir. Uh, the first page, sir, is it visible now? Flood in Bongaigab district? Yes. All right. Thank you, sir. So flood in Bongaigab district, a path to zero casualty. Uh, these were the innovative flood management practices that we did in the year 2021, which resulted in zero casualty. It was done by our District Disaster Management Authority. So basically, Bongaigao has the goal to achieve the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Two goals are important here. Goal number 11, that is make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. And goal number 30, to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. So our district, uh, actually, we are trying to shift from, um, you know, management once flood happens to uh, proactive prevention and mitigation. But just one point from here I would like to highlight. Council of Energy, Environment and Water, New Delhi, has ranked Bongaigao 37 out of 272 districts and uh, they have in their mapping India's vulnerability, a district level assessment, which was published in October 2021, rated Bongaigao as very highly vulnerable. I can uh, share the presentation and the soft copy. So if anyone would like to take a uh, you know, slower look at it, they can do that. So this yeah, is that, flood hazard. Flood that hazard. Data, Dr. Yes. I, I'll do that, sir. Yes. So we have had many deaths in the last many years. So our vision and planning was, as I told you, the zero casualty. 
So these are the interventions that we did. We identified our vulnerable villages. All the departments were asked to analyze past five years of their damages and make a list of which were the works that had to be done prior so that uh, disaster will not say, suppose there was a bund that was going to break, then you got to repair it beforehand itself. Or if there was a hamlet where people are not educated, then you got to do that earlier on itself. The rest of the interventions are here. These are some of the works that we did. This is all mitigation work. We had many rounds of meeting with, with the stakeholders and we had many exercises where schools were chosen, uh, where our fire and emergency service teams would teach the children what you should do if suddenly you fall into water, if you don't know how to swim, etc. So these are the list of our uh, villages, 297 of them. So outcome is that uh, we finally were able to get zero loss of human and animal life. Not only because of flood, but because of lightning also. We had an innovative management uh, plan, that is this vetiver plantation, as I told you. Since I have already explained it, I will not be running through further. This is, uh, you can see that this is how the river took a second channel. This was the regular channel. This is a new channel, which ate away almost 50 villages in that area. We did this vetiver plantation on the bund that was made by the locals itself. And finally, uh, you know, that bund still stands and that innovation has been taken up by Government of India, NIDM, to be a model innovation for uh, the rest of the country facing such problems. This is what uh, something that uh, one of our circles did, but basically it is based on the same theme, so I'm not hovering on it. These are all things that happen in our regular lives. We got to be in the field uh, for many, many, many days uh, once flood happens. So that's it uh, from my side now, sir. Should there be any queries later on, I'll be happy to um, answer them. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Lakshmi Pia. It was so wonderful to hear your, uh, you know, field level experience. Precisely that was the expectation from your end. And I'm very happy that you touched upon the practical experiences. Please be there. Um, there will be a Q&A round. So uh, now we go to the next panelist, uh, Professor uh, Reja Rahman. Professor Rahman, if you kindly put on your camera. So Professor uh, Rahman is currently a professor at Institute of Water and Flood Management of Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology, which is popularly known as BUET. He is a civil engineer by profession. Among the courses that he teaches are water disaster management, water and ecosystem, and climate change risk management. He has been involved in a number of regional research projects such as ecosystem services for poverty alleviation, which, which we all know as ESPA. Deltas and then vulnerability and climate change, migration and adaptation project. And finally, Brahmaputra dialogue. Through these projects, he has worked closely with academicians from many Indian universities, such as uh, Jadupur University in Kolkata, our own institute, IIT Guwahati, IIT Kanpur, and so on and so forth. Professor Rahman has been involved in the formulation of a number of national plans and strategies such as National Water Management Plan of Bangladesh, and then Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan for his country, and so on. Professor Rahman is a member of various national international bodies. And if I start reading uh, uh, his uh, uh, series, it will be it will be taking quite a lot of time. So without wasting much time, I would like to request Professor Rahman to share his thought. Professor Rahman, over to you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Mitra, uh, for this nice introduction. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so uh, it is good to see uh, many of you. For example, Professor Rajiv Shah, I, I don't know whether he has already joined, but uh, I had the opportunity to work with him for quite long time. He has joined back, I think. Okay, 
Okay, welcome back, Professor Shaw. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, and then I uh, congratulate CDMR on this first anniversary, and I wish many occasions in the years to come. Uh, in, in my deliberation, I shall mainly uh, discuss about the uh, Indo-Bangla uh, flood management, uh, the scopes, the potentials, and the benefits. Uh, so, uh, for, first we recognize that uh, India and Bangladesh are part of the same watershed, basically Himalayan uh, watershed. So, if it was uh, if there were no uh, geographical boundary, we would have managed uh, the flood in the most rational manner, uh, definitely. But because of this geographical boundary, there are many issues between uh, two of us. And we gradually we are trying to overcome those issues. And I shall give some examples. The first example is that uh, we have started sharing the benefits of this watershed. Uh, for example, we are importing electricity from India, from Bhutan. Uh, there is now navigation and transit route through Bangladesh, uh, from Calcutta to Dibdugar. Just probably one or two months back, there was a pilot uh, run uh, from Calcutta to Dibdugar through Bangladesh. Uh, probably it was a 17 days trip, but I, I think it was worth uh, the trip. So uh, we have started joint management of Sundarbans mangrove forest. After the MEU that was signed between two prime ministers in 2011. So these are, these are the big steps uh, that both the countries are taking to share the benefits of this watershed. So we can surely cooperate in flood management also. Now, when we uh, discuss about the uh, flood, uh, we have to uh, recognize the, that flood is unlike any other disaster. Actually, in our country, many scientists uh, do not want to uh, declare flood as a disaster because of the long-term benefits uh, of flood. Uh, see that uh, Bangladesh uh, is uh, self-sufficient in food, which is uh, quite an achievement in the last 20, 30 years. And it is, it is ranked in the top four or five in production of many crops like in rice production, probably Bangladesh is now fourth. In fish, it is third, just behind India and China. Fruits, vegetables, there are lots of productions of many crops. So we are self-sufficient and food secure. Now that was a very difficult task that we had to uh, go through. Uh, and how did we achieve it? Because uh, firstly, uh, we see that Bangladesh is a flat plain country. And, and among all the uh, ecosystems, uh, flat plain is the most productive. So Bangladesh is heavily densely populated, as you know, and land area and land holding size of farmers are very small. Still, we are producing so much crops and so abundantly. Uh, this is because of the flood. Every year, flood uh, brings water, nutrients, and recharges this flood plain. And after every major flood, the, uh, the production is so huge that management of this uh, overproduction becomes a burden and problem for the government. So this, so the, so this is the difference uh, between flood and other disasters. Other disasters probably cause only damage. Flood, in a sense, if we consider the long-term uh, beneficial 
uh, aspects, then the damage, temporary damage or temporary problems are minuscule. But we have to manage that because during flood, uh, people really suffer uh, from uh, various uh, problems. So uh, post flood management is very important for Bangladesh. And we, as we uh, heard from deliberations of Dr. Lakshmi, it's also a uh, challenge in India, in Assam, that we all know. Now, Bangladesh uh, is known for management of its flood. Uh, previously, it was not so, but over the years, Bangladesh learned many lessons and applied its uh, knowledges to better manage the flood. So that's why uh, nowadays, after major floods, we don't hear any uh, uh, news of famine, which was common 50 years back. You know of the famous 1974 famine after the uh, flood. But after 1974, many floods have occurred, but uh, we do not hear about uh, food deficiency or famines. So uh, because the government immediately starts supporting the farmers with seeds, with fertilizers, with cash support, various types of supports for post-flood management has improved a lot uh, over, over the years. So the idea is that the that the if the people can accommodate or adjust to these temporary uh, setbacks, eh, then the, we take advantage of the long-term uh, benefits of the flood. So previously, 30, 40 years back, the uh, focus was on structural adaptation, but nowadays it is more focused on non-structural uh, options, eh, relocating people or evacuating people during floods, giving them livelihood support, medical support, uh, giving farmers the inputs they need so that they can immediately start uh, plantations. So these are the things that uh, government do very efficiently. And uh, of course, our, our government officials have become very efficient, uh, uh, like Dr. Lakshmi. So, uh, the governance also of uh, the post flood management has improved a lot, I shall say. So, uh, and, and another aspect of Bangladesh, important aspects is that the evolution of the uh, NGOs. The NGO sector is very strong in Bangladesh. Yeah. And NGOs over the years have played vital role in development uh, of the country, especially in disaster risk reduction. So uh, you have heard about BRAC, you have heard about Grameen. So these are the famous examples of uh, NGO, famous NGOs. So uh, government utilized these strengths of NGOs right, in benefit targeting, in disbursement of loans, right, because they are more, uh, uh, they are closer to the community. Right? So this, this is one big advantage that Bangladesh uh, has, and I hope, uh, both of our countries, India and Bangladesh, will take uh, advantage of the services of NGOs. So this is uh, one uh, one thing uh, that I, I want to mention. And so, and then the uh, flood uh, forecasting, we can reduce the damages if we have good forecast of flood. Now our country is downstream of the uh, Himalayan basin. So we have to depend on uh, India about the flood information that is happening upstream. So we nowadays we get, get uh, lots of information uh, from, especially from Asham, Gohati, Paraka, and the other uh, regional rivers. So, uh, but we need more. More information is better that we all know. For example, we uh, now. Uh, Till now, we get flood information from Gohati, but if we start getting information from Dibrugor, then we have longer lead time. Uh, till now, we can uh, forecast floods up to 24 hour lead time. Uh, good, good forecast. Three, three days uh, forecast, five days forecast, 
are not that accurate. But if we get uh, information from, from further upstream, then that will help us uh, to uh, give better forecast with a longer lead time so that farmers and others get uh, more time to prepare. And if they are more prepared, of course, uh, the damages or the inconvenience during flood will be will be less. So uh, and and also the rainfall data, eh? rainfall data uh, is also needed uh, because of the climate change. Rainfall pattern has become very erratic. So uh, up, rainfall data from upstream is becoming very important uh, for uh, flood forecasting. Uh, for example, in 2019, uh, Brahmaputra had five floods. Uh, one after another uh, peaks, which which was very unusual because of the very high rainfall here and there. So this is uh, one important uh, aspects of uh, flood forecasting because of climate change. Our dependency uh, uh, is increasing, and then uh, modeling and forecasting can go go together. India is good in uh, forecasting of the riverine floods. We are good at uh, forecasting floods on the flood plains. So this, this can be combined. Uh, expertise of both countries can be combined for the benefits of the uh, people of uh, both countries. Uh, I uh, understand that there is a now modeling center in Guwahati, which was uh, developed with support from Bangladesh. Uh, we have good modeling center, uh, quite old modeling center, and they supported establishment of this uh, modeling center in Guwahati, which is which is uh, uh, good. Now the academician. Now why we don't uh, share more data, more knowledge? Still there are barriers. I I, I have said the, although the situation is improving, because of the lack of confidence we have, we still have. So, but one thing is that community is already sharing knowledge. Yeah, Professor Rajiv Shah was mentioning about the. Uh, open-ended uh, science. Uh, in Meghalaya, uh, there is a flash flood coming from Meghalaya to Bangladesh, very rapid flash flood. These are technologically very difficult to forecast, but uh, the uh, communities upstream, yeah. they are probably related or they don't know each other. So they start giving uh, flood information uh, to the people downstream uh, that in Bangladesh. Yeah. Uh, over mobile. Now, now we have technological advancement, which is breaking many barriers autonomously. We have to accept that. Eh? So, uh, so we 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 can share community-wise. There can be uh, sharing of knowledges and information. Now, in, academically, uh, we started a program in 2005, the South Asian Water Fellowship Program, SAWA Fellowship Program. Under that, there are fellows in master's and PhD programs from India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Yeah. So this was a regional program, and I shall say very successful. It is still running in some form or another after 15 years. In the first five years, from Bangladesh alone, there were 50 postgraduate students graduation. So the idea was that that uh, the uh, to develop a pool of professionals who understands uh, viewpoints of each, each other countries. This is the problem, no? I, I, from Bangladesh, I don't know India's uh, viewpoint. Indian professionals do not know our viewpoint. So we wanted to break this barrier gradually. So this pool of professionals, they formed a network. They visited each other's institutes. They worked under each other professor. So this, this was a very good way of creating a regional pool of professionals who understands each other's problems better. Hopefully, as time goes by, they will uh, the situations will be, will automatically be uh, better. And as that was uh, uh, this Sour Fellowship program was coordinated by Saki Waters, uh, based in Hyderabad. Uh, that that is an uh, NGO and. Uh, Professor Anamika Borua, uh, she is in IIT uh, now, who was once the executive director uh, of that Saki Water uh, program. So uh, you can hear from her. Uh, 
and uh, uh, her, her experience. I mean, a CDRM is a, in a very good position to uh, promote such kind of regional uh, program. Uh, this disasters knows no boundary, we all know that. Uh, when Assam is affected by an earthquake, our river shift, old Brahmaputra shifted to Brahmaputra and caused a major uh, damage. So, so the, these are regional uh, programs uh, can be developed, academic uh, programs. And I understand there are now Bangladeshi students in CDRM, which is very good. Uh, so these are the ways we can break down those barriers uh, that is still hampering us. But on a positive note, I shall say, we have achieved a lot over the last 20, 30 years. And now the situations are not much better and we can build on that. So on that uh, note, I conclude and I thank uh, CDMR and Professor Mitro for inviting me uh, to, to be a panelist in this session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Rahman, for uh, uh, sharing your, you know, vast knowledge about Indo-Brahmaputra and associated uh, hazards and disasters. And uh, as as I informed you, you also mentioned that we we in one year we have already moved towards that direction that you have suggested. The first step is that we were lucky to have. Uh, one uh, PhD student from Bangladesh as international student, Ms. Pratiba Odhikari. She has already joined. She is here in the campus, probably listening you also. And uh, we also are actually uh, thinking about certain activities which you have mentioned. And once you are here today, I will be behind you. I can assure that. Um, so, uh, also, we I, I am in touch with your present uh, director or head, um, Sajan Bhai. So, uh, so we we will definitely would like to have a collaborative uh, project very soon, and I will intimate about that how to go about that. CDM are here, and our uh, director Professor Sitaram, um, you know, always uh, encourage about uh, you know networking. Network of excellences. He always, uh, you know, uh, convey that messages, and definitely we will be in touch with you. So thank you once again, Professor Arman. So that uh, brings the end of uh, the uh, formal uh, panel discussions. Now uh, let me take this opportunity to to uh, invite one of our PhD students uh, who has joined only this December batch. Uh, Shurbi uh, Vyash, Shurbi, are you there? So Shurbi, uh, uh, I would request you to, you know, yeah, good. So uh, she only actually could not able to join at the very beginning. So uh, Shurbi, you please take it forward quickly with the Q&A round. So over to you, Shurbi. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, respected directors and speakers for highlighting the importance of the topic of today's seminar. Sorry for some of the technical issues. I was not able to attend in the uh, join this webinar in the beginning. And I just lost the opportunity to introduce our head, Dr. Sudeep Mitra as well. But I don't want to lose this opportunity. And I and I want to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Sudeep Mitra he is also the associate professor at the School of the Agro and the Rural Technology. And uh, he is also an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences India and a Fulbright Fellow as well as a visiting fellow at visiting faculty at the University of California, Davis, USA. He is also a member of the South Asia Alliance of Disaster Risk institute and an editorial board member for international journal climate change by plos now i want to continue uh, this session with the question answer sessions so we have the number of uh, questions but before proceeding that i would request all the panelists to kindly turn off uh, turn on their camera so that we can have a snapshot uh, very quickly a group snapshot In fact, uh, Shurdeep, uh, uh, here I request all the 
all the uh, not only panelists but also others um, at the please wait we will have a group picture um, at the last moment so please be there thank you subhi please go ahead okay so now i continue with the question answer sessions as we have number of questions from the participants so my first question is for professor rajiv shaw uh from uh, devdoot sen gupta he is asking sir like just like we have earthquake zones in india can we categorize the states based on a common disaster frame like out of 10 thank you thank you very much i think that's a very very uh, valid question uh, ideally my answer would be yes yes we can and we should categorize the states based on different types of multi hazard uh, but you know that in india like it's a complex um, i will say governance structure the national state relationship is different and when it comes to the disaster risk reduction disaster risk reduction is usually a state subject uh, some of you might be knowing that one where the first responses or first uh, uh, preparedness issues whether it is the disaster management plan pre disaster activities financing all this comes under the state issues so usually like all the states have different types of uh, uh, disaster response and disaster pre disaster preparedness issues but by saying that when it comes to the national zoning so especially for the earthquake zoning of course india has the national zoning pattern and if you know that there are this grading from 1 to 5 5 is the highest one is the lowest and the whole country is divided into uh, different types of zoning ways but i think uh, the most important part is that that zoning pattern is relatively crude i will say it's a, like more on the macro level but what we need and that possibly our um, our this the person who asked the question was possibly asking this is more micro level zoning and how we can make a more categorization about the micro level zoning and that part is very much lacking but i am sure that it is very much possible to make that type of customized zoning and in japan actually it's very very common also we don't have that type of complex structure between national and the prefecture government here in japan but definitely all over japan there is a uniform or a unified zoning system uh, which is usually followed uh, from national level to the prefecture level to the sub prefecture or the city level thank you thank you sir so the next question is by uh, tanmay ghosh for professor mohammad reza rehman and sir he is asking like actually he is asking two question like how we can control the adverse effect of disasters and crises on agriculture and food security particularly from the floods and his second question is also related to this like are there any innovative agriculture practices that the bangladesh has adopted to cope up from this well uh, the uh, in order to manage the adverse effect of flood uh, what uh, the farmers do and what the uh, government supports is that immediate transplantation after the recession of the flood uh, so uh, that is the usual practice and uh, previously without government support the farmers were not able to mobilize themselves so quickly now with the government support the farmers immediately after recession they go for cultivation for the second batch or third batch uh, of uh, crops so uh, that is the and since the flood has recharged the our flood plain the production is very high and the requirements irrigation requirements and the uh, fertilizer requirements are very low after after the floods so the that's why the crops uh, farmers get bumper crops and the uh, prices fall uh, as a result so that's another headache for the government uh, after the flood becomes so uh, that that is the way we manage the adverse effect of flood and the 
innovative uh, practice uh, the uh, the crop pattern is changing so that you can say one innovation so government in a stage of rise the government uh, nowadays promotes other crops which are quick yielding for example potato after a flood potato production is very good and quick yielding and uh, uh, doesn't require lots of irrigation so that is one uh, innovation but the original our innovation was that which is basically indigenous was that i mean planting flood tolerant variety of rice which grows with the flood and survives uh, any flood so it can rise up to 6 meters so uh, the, the, these were the indigenous practices that we have lost actually to survive floods but there is a, a movement to bring those indigenous practices back which are more flood resilient. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. And sir, for you only, there is another uh, question also from uh, Vishal, and he's asking, like, why South Asia is vulnerable to most of the disaster occur in the world, and how Bangladesh is tackling the sea level rise due to global warming? Well, uh, I think South Asia is more vulnerable to disaster probably simple answer is that it's god's wish but the another answer is that it's it's in the himalayan plateau which is basically new uh, considering the other uh, regions so it is i mean it's a completely in a dynamic flux and bangladesh is especially vulnerable to floods and landslides and droughts because uh, it's a, it's a uh, flat plain country and geographical location. I mean, three major rivers, uh, I mean, uh, they congregate in Bangladesh. So it creates uh, lots of pressure on uh, Bangladesh because of the geographical location. And the, you know, the Bay of Bengal is funnel shaped, so it's exposed to cyclones, a major problem. So, so it's geographical location makes it more vulnerable. And in general, South Asian region is more vulnerable to flood. And to global climate change, sea level rise, um, we have uh, amendments in the coastal region, which were built to protect that region from uh, tidal flood. So now government is raising that, uh, uh, say, for example, uh, by one meter, each embankment raising one meter in anticipation of the sea level rise. So that is the way we are proceeding right right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so my next question is again for uh, pro, uh, for Professor Rajiv Shaw. Uh, so Vishal is asking, sir, like, uh, what is the difference between the response of Japan and India's response to disaster? Where India lag in front of Japan? I, I won't, I don't dare to say that uh, which part India is lacking or which part Japan is lacking. You know that every disaster response or rather say the disaster risk reduction, oh. adapting to the disasters or the living with disaster concept, learning from the disaster, how you bring it to the next phase of disaster response. So there are many, many different aspects for that. So uh, there is no straightforward answer, unfortunately, that this part Japan is uh, advancing, this part India is lacking, because we also need to understand India's context. It's such a big country, North, South, East, West has all different types of uh, connotation. The governance system is different. As I mentioned earlier, the disaster often becomes a state subject and the state and central government uh, responses become quite different. You might have seen this, uh, especially on the COVID response, like COVID, uh, the Indian government responded with the, uh, the National Disaster Act, the, what, what we have, the National Disaster Act. But then when it comes to the actual vaccination issue or the lockdown issues and all these things, these are all dependent on the state issues. So state 
responsible for whether they will decide the lockdown or whether they will do the vaccination and all these things. Same thing for the disaster as well. But one thing I can say that I think um, India has this very like uh, strong local responses, whether it is in Assam, whether it is in West Bengal, or whether it is in Gujarat, or whether it is in northern part of uh, India. I think that we need to possibly respect more on the quality of the local responses because ultimately the community and the local government that create the main quality of the response in any disaster situation. So more we try to focus more on that particular aspect of the local uh, responses with the combination of the local government, local institution, uh, like the research institution, local NGO, and the local community. More the quality of the response or quality of the overall disaster risk reductions becomes very good. So I think that will be my answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So my uh, next question is for Dr. Lakshmi Priya. Uh, Ma'am, uh, Aditya is asking you, like uh, current startup program or businesses which are based on disaster management in India or any other country? Like he's asking, like uh, there is any current startup program or businesses which are basically related to the disaster management and they are taking place in uh, India, especially or in any other country. Startup programs based on disaster management. Yes, ma'am. I don't understand the import of the question. And I'm not aware of any startup programs regarding disaster reduction. What is the import of the question? If the if he could clarify. Uh, he's asking like, ma'am, uh, any other like type of organizations or the uh, NGOs you can say who are working for the disaster management basically in the country, in India or in any other country? There are many NGOs working in the field of disaster management, like, uh, you know, in all countries, in India also, in my district, I know that there are a couple of organizations that work basically um, during the management after the floods have happened. So, some, there are NGOs that work for, with respect to women. There are some who help in recycling of uh, clothes, etc., so that they can be converted into sanitary napkins, etc., that can be provided to women. Uh, during the time of floods, <clears throat> I don't know about any startup and what startup actually means in this context. I'm not very clear from the question. But if you are trying to ask if uh, everyone, including the government and the NGOs, all agencies are working together in India and other parts of the world, I'm sure they are. And I know that it is happening in Assam and Bongaiga for sure. Okay. Uh, thank uh, you, ma'am. Surdi, yeah. Surdi, sorry. Uh, probably I can just, uh, I understood the question that uh, the person asked. Um, yes. Is that, I think that uh, Dr. Lakshmi Priya, uh, when he actually meaning startup, I think he is trying to mention that if there is any kind of innovative uh, uh, startup which is working on some kind of designing of some uh, uh, kits or, uh, or designing of some safe housing or say, designing of early warning system so helping those kind of thing for the district administration definitely when you go for management you look for some instrument some some gadgets so i think that is the line because iit students i can understand what they are meaning startup means if some technology related thing okay thank you thank you dr mitra Actually, there are many of that of those kinds. Uh, if he is an IIT student, he will also know that uh, IIT Roorkee has come up with uh, uh, some kind of a technology of uh, um, basically an agriculture related technology where you can prevent loss of soil from the top layers when you know flood waters come up. There are many researchers. Uh, uh, regarding flood resistant variety of um, rice paddy which we are using now as is in the case of bangladesh also as professor has mentioned before such researches are definitely ongoing there are some early warning system 
attempts which have not been of much uh, use in the field for us. We keep hearing of some of the other mechanisms like that, but we have not been, they have not condensed down to a form in which we are able to use them. So, as of now, we have uh, successfully been using uh, these um, <coughs> flood resistant varieties of paddy and other crops that can be grown soon after the flood season is over because of the large deposition of alluvial soil. Mm, and uh, some technology for, as I told earlier, conversion of, uh, you know, books or clothes, etc., to more usable forms. That is what I am aware of. I, I have worked with till now. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, for you, there is one more question. Uh, again, Aditya is asking, like, how the government work or support has changed in any disaster management plan since 2005? And how Japan is leading in compare to us? Thank you, Aditya. I do not know the relevance of the year 2005 in it, but uh, uh, a lot of changes have definitely happened with respect to disaster management in India. Uh, see, I'll talk about Assam in a more contextual manner. See, earlier on when floods used to happen, you had to wait for a year or so for all the uh, damages to be paid by government. And now the collectors can take a decision at the district level itself. You find out that some damage has happened, you can, um, you know, you, are, you have it devolved that power. So uh, the, those kind of local level issues have been sorted out. In addition to that, there are many collaborations with uh, um, centers of excellence, which have been able to give us technological solutions. I don't know if uh, you know disaster management in Japan and India can be compared without a proper proper scale. The kind of disasters that have happened in different parts of the world are different. So I don't think it will be appropriate to compare and say that Japan's handling of disasters is much better than India. What I think we should concentrate much more is how we will share knowledge. So uh, our situation is different, theirs is different. <clears throat> like you see, I was attending a program by JICA, Japan-India Cooperation Agency, which was with respect to uh, evidence-based public health planning. So what we understood at the end of the session after one month's course is that situations are different in every place. We have to learn to mobilize the best for what is best for that place. But of course, as Professor has earlier on told, micro level zonation will help India also. How Japan has been able to do micro level zonation for small smaller uh, places instead of our macro level zonation in five categories that might definitely of assistance for us. Thank you. Surbhi, unmute. Surbhi, unmute yourself, please. And probably, probably how many questions you have still? Sir, three questions. Good. Okay, fine. Thank uh, so, thank you so much, ma'am. And there is one more question for you from Bhargav. And he's asking, like, how much the education campaigns about instantaneous uh, mitigation techniques can be handy in reducing aftermath of disaster? Are there uh, thank any... Thank you, Bhargav. This... Yeah, please go on. Yeah, yes, ma'am. His, uh, his, his question is continued, like, are there any campaigns held till date in Assam state about earthquakes or floods? And he's also asking, like, how about explaining people the importance of construction of building resilience to uh, resilient to earthquake, like those which are being constructed in Japan? Yes, uh, thank you, Pargo. Very relevant question. Actually, uh, what uh, there is a calendar uh, every year by by which we um, take up. Uh, education activities at school levels and at gram panchayat levels regarding how your response would be to any disaster. That has actually added a lot to saving lives. So that uh, is definitely ongoing. But uh, because of COVID, since schools are closed and since I cannot 
I mean, no one can allow gathering of people. It is difficult to uh, arrange for such workshops, but otherwise, a uh, hands-on workshop of uh, disaster management is always an ongoing exercise. There is a disaster management calendar in which it is incorporated. In my district, we have started off with a project called Project Mrityunjai. Mrityunjai would literally translate as the uh, winning over death. So basically, that is not for natural disaster. That is for accidents, death caused by road traffic accidents. So as part of that, we had a campaign of uh, demonstration of how you will handle a situation when it comes. Say, for example, you find someone lying on the road after a, after he has met with an accident. Now, how do you lift him up? If you just pull him up, you might make him paraplegic for life. So there is a way in which you have to immobilize his neck, immobilize his hip, immobilize his back, so and so on and so forth. So we demonstrated that and we gave the first-hand information I and mean, first-hand training to our first responders. So such, uh, such education is ongoing and they're very, very significant. The second part of your question, uh, uh, Surabhi, could you please tell me the second part of his question? You, you are muted. Sorry, ma'am. Uh, he is asking, uh, are there any campaigns held till date in Assam state about earthquakes and floods? So campaign, uh, I, I presume he is asking if there are awareness campaigns, yes, isn't it? Yes. So such campaigns, as I told you, it's not a campaign. Campaign is for a shorter period of time when you really have to, uh, it is like uh, you want everyone to be vaccinated. So you start a vaccination campaign. So that is different from this. This is an ongoing program. Uh, both earthquake and floods are both education for both are handled at uh, the school levels and gram panchayat levels, as I told you earlier. Such campaign is definitely ongoing, but I think it will be different for different parts of the country because India is very, very different, isn't it? So the kind of campaign that might happen in Assam may not actually be relevant in Orissa, where you will have to, uh, you know, let them know more about how to handle a cyclone situation. Or in Kerala, where there may be more landslides than floods from Brahmaputra River. So it is different. So I'm sure that it is there in different forms in all parts of the country. It's definitely there in Assam. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, there is one more question for you from Saurav. And he's asking, like, uh, being in the actual field and taking decisions on the ground, how you feel having so much responsibility on your shoulder and what encourage you to take the valuable decision without any distraction? Well, that's kind of uh, putting my life all together in one question. So, Saurabh, uh, thank you for the question. It is... Uh, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's a decision that one takes one when one enters into IAS. Uh, basically, I was a doctor before I joined in IAS, so I was happy and content with treating my patients. But I thought that I'll get a larger uh, larger scale and scope of work if I will shift on to IAS. That is why I came in here. And uh, once you really uh, sit here and you see that your decision is going to make the life of a person better or worse, or for that matter, uh, 10 lakh of people, then uh, uh, you understand that uh, your responsibility is towards them. Your allegiance is towards making their life better. That is the role of uh, an officer from Indian Administrative Service. And uh, how can it? How can you be distracted when there is a lot of uh, there, there is a lot that depends upon your decision. So, yes, it is very difficult. At times, it becomes very difficult. And, and all the more as a lady, when I used to have a very small baby, it used to be all the more distracting. But, uh, I mean, uh, it has all added on to the cause. The cause is what keeps me going. If that is what uh, Saurabh was trying to ask. Thank, Thank you, you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for your wonderful and informative answers. Now, there is one more question and it's from Dr. Praveen Kumar and it's open for all the panelists. Like, what can be the best solution for Bihar uh, flood situations? Is there any alternate or way out for minimize the loss of humans, cattle lives, etc. due to flooding of Bihar, Assam or any other flood prone area? I think one of the subject experts should answer it. 
Professor Rahman, uh, I know you are not you are not expert on Bihar flood, okay. but I think that as a flood as a general, if you can just comment briefly. Well, uh, I can tell that Bihar floods are basically connected to the Nepal Nepal region, so that is one contribution I can make. So Dr. Rahman can continue the rest. Yes. Yes, actually, this, this is a very good point. Actually, we are in the similar situation uh, to Bangladesh. I mean, we are downstream of India. Bihar is downstream of Nepal. And during the Kosi flood, the, most of the flood water came from Nepal. And the one thing is that is aggravating the flood is the interventions upstream. Hmm? Uh, so the dams, we are building dams, uh, many dams upstream, and when there is a, a huge rainfall, which has become become very frequent uh, under the climate change scenarios, the risk is increasing. Hmm? Uh, lead time is decreasing. So my favorite option is uh, ecosystem approach to, especially to flood, as I have said during my deliberation. The flood is, I mean, not that damaging. Uh, if you can just survive that difficult uh, one to two months, then it is all benefits of, of flood. So, uh, so use non-structural options as much as possible, wherever possible. It is not possible everywhere. Like in our coast, we need embankments. But then again, embankments can be made uh, more environment friendly. We have to be responsive to the environment. Uh, that that will be my uh, prescription. <laughs> that uh, uh, flood uh, needs to be managed in a very environmentally responsible manner, and we have to adapt ecosystem based approach, like the using vetiver grass. Dr. Lakshmi mentioned we are also using vetiver grass for protection of the river banks against embankments. So these are the uh, possible approaches that we all need to take to minimize the flood damages. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I would request all the panelists and the participants to kindly turn on the camera so that we can have a quick uh, group snapshot. And I request Ashutosh to please click a quick snapshot. Take uh, six people in one frame, but not all due to the uh, layout of the WebEx. No, uh, there is uh, actually uh, Bishal, you can you can try to take it. Yes, please. You change your layout, uh, Ashutosh. Ashutosh, Bishal. Whoever any, can. Any, any one of you can take. Sir. If it is done, let us know. Then we'll proceed to close the session. Zaur bhai, very good to see you. Same very way. much looking forward to see you in Bangladesh very soon. Okay. In person, huh? <laughs> in person, yeah. So, enough, uh, of Zoom, uh, enough of Zoom call. So uh, I very much look forward for seeing you in person. Uh, all sir, of uh, should, all of us should go to Buet. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Sudip, you will enjoy the atmosphere of Buet. I really enjoyed it for five years in our JICA project and the yeah, hospitality yeah. of Reza Urvai. And the biryani he ordered for the for the uh, lunch is just amazing. Right. I, I went to Bikas uh, to Salimul Hawk to meet Salimul Hawk. 
Uh, anyway, so Surbi, over to you for the proceedings. Sir, if biryani is in the menu, I would request that DC Bongaiga also be part of your next project. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I would request doctors of the Karmarkar to give a vote of thanks to all the speakers and participants. As Sogta sir is the CPC, CPPC Secretary of uh, CDMR and Associate Professor in the Department of Design. He is the editorial board member and reviewer for many number of journals. He is the member of Indian Science Congress Association and in Human Factor, uh, Factor and Argon, uh, Argonomics Society USA. He is also having a huge number of achievements but again due to the shortage of time I have to conclude include here only. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Shulavi. Thank you for your nice words. So good afternoon to all. So it is my great pleasure to deliver a vote of thanks in front of this August gathering. On behalf of CDMR family, first and foremost, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our honorable director, sir, Professor T.G. Sitaram, for accepting our invitation and delivering inaugural speech in spite of his BGT schedule. And it is, we must mention that, okay, from the very beginning, he has played instrumental role for establishing this center. And also with that, I want to mention that this, all these activities, whatever we are doing for last one year, that is also possible under his level guidance and encouragement along with Professor Shodip Mitro as our HOC. Now, I want to express our sincere gratitude to all the panel members, Professor Rajiv Shah from Kyo University, Japan, uh, then Dr. Lakshmi Priya, ma'am, then uh, Professor uh, Mohammad Rejaul Rahman from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. So we are really thankful to all the panelists because within a very short notice, they have accepted our invitation and they manage their time to interact with us, deliver wonderful speeches. And we got really uh, very important insight related to how the scientific knowledge technological knowledge and management knowledge can be brought to the field like as mentioned by Dr. Lakshmi Priya that how administrator can utilize those knowledge. On the other hand, as Professor Shaw, Professor Rajal Rahman mentioned that on the other hand, administrative knowledge and all other aspects of science and technology, how we can utilize for disaster risk mitigation and at the same time, the disaster for overall disaster management. We want to express our sincere thanks to head of the center, CET, Center for Education and Technology, Professor Hemant B. Koushik and his supportive staff members for extending their support for live streaming of this event. I also want to, I mean, we must thank to our participants, all the participants, enthusiastic participants. Without their participation, this event could not be successful and also all the students and also other faculty colleagues imposed good number of questions during question and answer session and our uh, knowledgeable uh, guests, speakers, they also handled all the questions very nicely and we really got insight from their address. Now, I want to express our thanks to all the faculty colleagues from CDMR and all our beloved students, master students, PhD students for their continuous support for our day-to-day -day activities as well as for organizing this program. Here I particularly want to mention our role of student volunteers. They played very instrumental role. Okay, They also worked at the background for preparing the brochure, communicating with the people. So they are really helped us a lot for organizing this event. Here I particularly want to mention the name of Shubham and Devdut. 
but all not only both of them but all other students really uh, we volunteered for this event at the end i want to mention that uh, this all the panelists i expect that they will extend their continuous support for betterment of cdmr and also for prosperity of cdmr in near future so thank you all with this i am concluding the session so thank you all thank you so that's uh, that's the uh, uh, end of uh, today's uh, webinar to celebrate uh, the first anniversary of uh, center for disaster management and research so once again on behalf of uh, uh, cdmr and iit guwahati i thank all the panelists and uh, 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 request professor shaw to put on your camera please professor shaw um, and also uh, the students uh, most of the students uh, across the country they have joined and they remain actually logged in and we have as i said that a uh, uh, couple of students from bangladesh and a uh, couple of faculty and students from japan and of course uh, all over india from jammu kashmir till kanyakumari i have seen in tamil nadu also so thank you once again to all of you and special thanks to my colleagues from center for disaster management and research that uh, even with their busy schedule and we have another meeting line up at 5:30 for cdmr only faculty meeting so without taking much of time from all of you uh, i would like to say it was a pleasure meeting you all and very soon we will be meeting again and also biryani will be there thank you very much and thank take you. care good night thank, thank you, you sir all the best thank to cdmr you. and everyone thanks thank you thank you, thank you. sir and ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you sir